I ask you a question. On which side will you be? On which side will you be? Our text is Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. And as we read through what Jesus teaches here, I think it'll become obvious what that question is about. <clears throat> so verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. <clears throat> I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick. And you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it to me. <clears throat> then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Our passage for today comes from what the Bible commentators call the Olivet Discord. Chapters 25 and 26 of Matthew are a sermon Jesus taught on the Mount of Olives shortly before the crucifixion. The content of this sermon is prophetic, and this passage in particular concerns Jesus' prophecy of the final judgment. So I think it's important for us <clears throat> to look at this and comprehend what's going on because all of us will be there. We are in this scene that he prophesies about. Now the language he uses is not literal. The sheep and the goats to which he refers represent human beings. In fact, these are all human beings that have lived since the beginning of time. Everyone from Adam and Eve down to the present day and those that will yet be born into this world. All the babies that have been aborted will be there. Just imagine what some people are going to feel and sense when they see that there in front of them. The actions he mentions over which people are judged while valid measures of conduct are representative of the moral responses of people's lives to the will of God. So the visiting and the feeding and the drinking and so forth like that, those are good things to do, but they are representative 
of moral responsible uh, responses in our lives to the will of God. Now, one thing we learn from this lesson is that the final judgment is the province of the Son of Man. Okay? That's the person that calls this together and has authority over it. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, the Apostle Paul tells us, we must all, how many is all? Okay, starting with Adam, all the way down to the last person born into the world, we must all appear before the judgment seat of whom? Of Christ. Why? That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Paul also teaches this in the, his second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.1. He says there, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So clearly, it is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be the judge at the final judgment. In our lesson, Jesus speaks of the Son of Man sitting on his throne, gathering all the nations together for judgment, and then dividing the sheep from the goats. Well, who is this Son of Man of whom Jesus speaks? Well, he himself answers that question for us in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. The Bible there says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So Jesus identifies himself as the Son of Man. So in this prophecy of the final judgment, it is Jesus Christ that calls this judgment to order. Jesus is the one who will gather all people together for the judgment. And the fact is evident from what Jesus taught us in John chapter 5, verse 25 and verse 28. There he says, Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. <clears throat> so clearly it is the voice of Jesus Christ that initiates the events of the final judgment. And the Apostle Paul teaches the same and similar words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. He wrote there, for the Lord himself, okay, Jesus Christ, the Lord himself, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Again, Jesus will be the one that initiates the final judgment. But notice in our lesson what Jesus teaches, that after the sheep and goats have been separated, it is the king who then pronounces judgment. Well, who is the king? Is he someone other than the Son of Man? Well, Paul again answers that question to 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. As we just read when he wrote, The Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and what? His kingdom. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, is also the king in his kingdom, the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so that begs the question, why will Jesus be the judge of all people at the final judgment? 
That's a fair question to ask. Why Jesus? One might reasonably ask, won't God be our judgment at the judgment? And I guess, you know, if you just go around town and asking people the question, who's going to be your judge at the final judgment? Probably 99.9 .9 people say, God's going to be my judge. Okay? But keep in mind who Jesus actually is. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Jesus is revealed as God. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And the name Emmanuel meaning God with us, as we also read in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. And also Mark begins his gospel in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, writing, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So what is said here is the fact of the incarnation. And may I say that is a mystery that we cannot fully comprehend. We know what it is, we can describe it theologically, but do we fully comprehend the Trinity? And I say not. God is revealed in Scripture as Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet only one indivisible God. Now the persons of the Godhead express the operation of the one God. The Father wills. The Son is the word expressing the will of the Father. And the Holy Spirit enacts the will of the Father. As Jesus sits in judgment over the human race, his actions and words are the expression of the revealed will of God as given to all mankind. <clears throat> but why is Jesus sitting in judgment and not a visible rep representation of the Trinity or, or simply God? Well, Jesus tells us why in John chapter 5, verses 26 and 27. There he said, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. The Father has given the authority for judgment to Jesus because he is the Son of Man. And Jesus explains further in John chapter 12, verses 46 to 48. There he said, I've come as light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Jesus tells us he came as a light. That, he, that is, he is the expression of God revealed through his words. His first coming into the world was not for the purpose of judging people. His first coming was solely for the purpose of saving people from their sins. In his first coming, Jesus came as the Son of Man. The Son of Man. Why is this important? Well, Hebrews 4 verses 14 to 16 tells us why. The writer there wrote, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. But listen to this. But was at all points 
tempted as we are. He was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus came as our high priest. That is, he came as the mediator between God and all human beings. Between God and you, my friend. He is our high priest. And as our high priest, he personally identifies with every human being so that he could plead our individual cases in the light and will of God. But notice that as the Son of Man, he lived his life on earth solely as a man, solely as a human being. And in that capacity, he faced the very thing that separates people from God, which is our personal sin. Notice, he was tempted in every point. Humans experience temptation to sin. But yet in his humanity, he found the grace of God through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to resist and overcome temptations. You see, Jesus, even though he was the Son of God, as the Son of Man, he did not rely on his personal divinity to overcome temptation. He faced his temptations in the same nature as all humans, as proved in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. And let me read that from the Living Bible, as it renders these verses in very understandable English. It says, Since we, God's children, are human beings made of flesh and blood, He became flesh and blood too, by being born in human form. For only as a human being could he die, and in dying break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in that way could he deliver those who through fear of death have been living all their lives as slaves to constant dread. We all know he did not come as an angel, but as a human being, yes, a Jew. And it was necessary for Jesus to be like us, his brothers, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God, a priest who would be both merciful to us and faithful to God in dealing with the sins of the people. For since he himself has now been through suffering and temptation, he knows what it is like when we suffer and are tempted. And he is wonderfully able to help us. That is very beautifully put. I know the <clears throat> awesomeness of the authorized version is, is just really overpowering, but it uses words that we're not used to. This rendering is quite simple and really deals with it in a way we can understand. What it's saying is that Jesus earned the right to be the judge at the final judgment because he faced and overcame temptation, thereby blazing the spiritual trail for us to follow in our temptations as taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 which is very straightforward. <clears throat> there the Apostle Paul wrote, No temptation has overtaken you, you except such as is common to man. <clears throat> and remember, Jesus was a man in that sense. The common temptation we all face, he faced, such common to man. <clears throat> but God is what? God is faithful. How do we know God is faithful? who will not allow you, put your name there, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, 
but will with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. <clears throat> Friends, there can be no defense for committing sin at the final judgment because Jesus has proved to us that temptation can be overcome if you will just follow the spiritual path that he set out for you. While that is an inescapable fact, notice in our lesson that Jesus the King gives our commendation or condemnation over absolutely another issue. Another issue. So, according to the teaching of Jesus, what is the issue at the final judgment? <clears throat> the king commends the sheep because they gave him food and drink, visited him and took him in, clothed him, visited him when he was sick, and came to him when he was in prison. Okay? You remember that? Also, notice that the goats are condemned because they did not do the very same things. While these things can be classified as good works, Jesus is not teaching that salvation and eternal life are granted because of good works. You see, the good works mentioned here represent something fundamentally basic to a personal relationship with God. Okay? There's more than just the clothing and the feeding and the drinking and visiting involved here. Remember that a lawyer of the Pharisees asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment of all? Do you remember that? That was in Matthew 22, verse 36. And Jesus answered him in verses 37 to 40. Jesus said this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now the love Jesus spoke of was not some kind of a tender feeling, but the agape love. And for your notes, that is spelled A. G-A-P-E, agape love, which is selfless, sacrificial, unconditional love is characterized in the earthly life of Jesus. And Jesus made a point of this love to his disciples, disciples in John 13, verses 34 and 35. He says, a new commandment I give to you. What is this commandment? that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. <clears throat> Adam Clark gives us some insight what Jesus meant here. He wrote this, in one sense, are we to understand that this was a new commandment? Okay. How is this a new commandment? Because it sounds familiar, doesn't it? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself was a positive precept of the law. Leviticus 19, verse 18. And it is the very same that Jesus repeats here. How then is it new? Our Lord answers this question. Even as I have loved you. Now, Christ has more than fulfilled the Mosaic precept. He not only loved his neighbor as himself, but he loved him more than himself. For he laid down his life for men. And this he calls upon the disciples to imitate him, to be ready on all occasions to lay down their lives for each other. Friends, this kind of love cannot be pretended. It can only be experienced through the new birth and a life lived under the influence of the Holy Spirit. 
John wrote in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. Sound like Jesus? Let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who is, excuse me, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And on the contrary, he wrote in verse 8, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And he reiterates what Jesus taught in verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. At the final judgment, all humanity will be separated into spiritual sheep and goats based on the experience of salvation or the lack thereof. That separation takes place before the judgment. Okay? Remember, Jesus separates the goats and the sheep through salvation. He said, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. That happens in this life. And the goats are those who reject Jesus Christ and his offer of salvation. That happens in this life. So that determination is made before we even get there to the final judgment. The final issue Christ will pronounce upon will be love as he has made possible for us to love as God loves. You see, only two kinds of love will be present at this judgment. The sheep are those that possess the love of God as expressed in the life of Jesus. The goats, on the other hand, are those that love themselves more than God. My friend, on which side will you be? Amen.